Welcome. She wants a world without the super rich, but claims that this will also make the rich happier. In her book, Limitarianism, The Case Against Extreme Wealth, Professor Inger Albeins argues that we need a cap on wealth to tackle the ch challenges of our time. Professor Rob Baines holds the Chair in Ethics of Institutions at Utrecht University. She researches and teaches political philosophy, but she also identifies herself as a political activist. We're really happy to be able to interview her on our stage today, and we're glad that you could all come and join. My name is Nayanthara. I'm Kai. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Ingrid Robbins. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Oops. <laughs> so Professor Robbins, uh, welcome on stage chat room for discussion. Thank you for being with her today. Um, today, obviously, we're going to discuss your book. I see your brother with you. Um, and in your book, you make, make a case against extreme wealth. But we wonder what first sparked your interest in studying inequality. Inequality in general. And extreme wealth, the yeah. rich between the two of them. I think I've always worked on inequality. I was interested. My first, I first studied economics, and uh, the reason why I wanted, to, why I decided to go and study economics, was that I that I believed at the time when I was 17 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it was the study that would most help me to help improve the world. That was perhaps a mistake, <laughs> but in any case, when I studied economics... Why, why was it a mistake? Oh, because I think economics has turned increasingly into modeling and uh, too many assumptions that are unrealistic. And if you do it at the advanced level, it's almost like a form of applied mathematics. So I think it's really... Um, I think the, the, what you have these days, these programs that are PPE or here in Amsterdam, PPLE, Mm -hmm. I think that is probably a <laughs> better way to go if you want I think to we have a room of students improve with the world here, here today. Yeah. 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 Lovely. So uh, in when I studied economics, I was interested in any case in the questions about inequality. Uh, but I became so interested in it that I decided to write my PhD dissertation on this, on specifically the question whether you could use existing theories to study inequalities between men and women, and I was particularly interested in the capability approach, mm -hmm. and so I've basically always been working on inequality. But this question about, about uh, extreme wealth, it, it occurred because there's this huge field of uh, scholars in economics, in political science, in philosophy, working on the, on the poor. Mm -hmm. All sorts of uh, data, research, where should you draw the poverty line, what about the incidents? What about uh, head, num head counts and so on? And it just occurred to me one day, like, why don't we have the same with the rich? And I don't know how it is for the other uh, scholars here in the room, but my experience is if you have, a, if you have a, a, an idea, you throw that over lunch to your colleagues, and sometimes they, they give a reason why you immediately kill the idea. Many of the ideas that we have actually are crap. <laughs> but in this case, my colleagues were just only making jokes. They couldn't really say, no, you can't do this, or no, you shouldn't do this, or no, this is not an interesting question. They were only making jokes. And which period of time are we? So that was 12 years ago. Okay. And then I thought, no, I don't, I mean, I should, re they were making jokes like, okay, so, and then you identify those that have too, money, too much money, what do you do? You're going to shoot them? Like they were making <laughs> stupid jokes. Mm -hmm. So this was around 2010, 2012. Yes. Ago? The, did the 2008 financial crisis have anything to do with that? Was there an event that put this on your horizon? It's possible. I recall it really as being be, not being driven by society, but being driven by this question like, why if we have a poverty line, why don't we have a richest line? Mm -hmm. But that really, if you ask that question, the reason why you're interested in this is really because the, the, those that are poor don't have enough money to have a good life. And the idea, the question was, can you at some point have so much money that actually you can't use it to increase your quality of life? That was the initial question. And that was also the first paper I wrote on this. But then eventually, um, when I started to talk about having a richest line, there were all these other reasons why actually it's not just for the person themselves that it's wasteful. So, so this, this perspective that I just sketched is a more like utilitarian perspective, but then there came all the other arguments to do with political uh, equality, with democratic values, with uh, climate and ecological sustainability, 
and then and that's why eventually I wrote a whole book with all the reasons why I think we should have a richest line. Well, at least a, a line where we say above this either it's harmful to society, it doesn't add to the quality of life of the rich themselves, and then there is the fundamental philosophical thing that nobody deserves so much money. So I think you've started um, describing some of the reasons, but I think a lot of people in our audience have not read your book in its entirety. Um, could you just summarize what limitarianism is for us? Yeah, so limitarianism is the view that um, there should be a cap to how much personal wealth a person can have. That's, that's the statement, the normative statement. And then, of course, the question is, why? Are, do we have any good reason? Because you can have all sorts of statements and some may have no reasons. And then the reasons were, just as I mentioned, that above a certain line, it doesn't add to the quality of life of those that are uh, so rich, whereas it could do much good elsewhere in society. That's one reason. The other uh, reason is that it's actually the wealth concentration is harmful because we see that uh, the very richest uh, undermine political equality, their lifestyles are incompatible with ecological sustainability, mm -hmm. those kind of arguments. And then the third reason is the most fundamental one, which is that you cannot, on any plausible account of, of moral desert, say that you deserve so much money. So those are the main reasons. But other scholars have written, for example, from the perspective of Republican theory, where non-domination is the central value, mm -hmm. and argued that we should have limitarianism because we needed to protect uh, everybody from not being dominated by other people in society. So if I can recap, recap your arguments, it's first it started by it actually doesn't make us happier, then it undermines political inequality, and third, there's a strong mental moral reason. Yeah, I mean, I tend not to use the happiness concept because I, um, in the theories of well-being, I'm more mm -hmm. kind in of those that endorse more objectivist accounts mm -hmm. of well-being, but it's, it, co it boils down to the same. And Maybe you can clarify what an objectivist account would be. Yeah, so obje an objectivist account of well-being would look at well-being as what can we actually do mm -hmm. in our lives. So the capability approach, for example, is, an, object is a, an objectivist account where you just look at what kind of lives can we lead, and then you, when you think about this empirically, you go into the area of what sociologists often call social indicators. So uh, do you have decent housing? Do you, uh, can you have a, hold a meaningful job? Uh, are people healthy or do they have access to health care? Those kind of indicators. Whereas people who, do, who work with the happiness as a, as a construct of well-being, they would ask either, um, your, they would ask a question about your life satisfaction. Like They ask you, like, uh, tell me, uh, how satisfied are you on a... On a 8.5 today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> on a scale from 0 to 10. Or they ask about, um, so one is more cognitive and the other is more the emotions that you feel and then they make a, they make a mix. I mean, this is really quibbles among scholars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you could also say indeed that uh, extreme wealth doesn't make you uh, yeah. very happy. But your argument tries to look at what we can do with it to improve the quality of our lives. Yeah. And each of these, I think you mentioned already, but is there one that is the strongest ar argument for you, the most important one? So I think the um, the political is context dependent. It's much worse in the U.S. than it is in Europe because in Europe we have s more solid walls between the sphere of money and the sphere of politics. Um, although those walls are not perfect, so still people with lots of money can uh, uh, undermine political equality by lobbying, by paying for lobbyists, and so on. Um, the ecological argument holds for the whole world. The, I think the most, I would say, like devastating argument for those who want mm -hmm. to argue for that we should be able to have as much money as we want is the uh, argument based on dessert. But it's also, I think, the, possibly the most controversial because it is based on a view of human nature that, is, that I believe to be correct, mm -hmm. to be true, but it is in opposition with what we tend to uh, ha have as a, as a dominant view of human nature in societies, in uh, present-day neoliberal societies. And so that is one that many people find hard to swallow. And this is the argument of? 
desert, moral desert. Nobody deserves to be a multimillionaire. Yeah. And we are very enthusiastic to go into this deeper, and we want to go deeper into this later in this interview. But we also felt that maybe it was necessary to address the elephant in the room at this point, because we both read your book, and we discussed it, and we we're enthusiastic. And when we tried to um, energize or make our friends enthusiastic about this interview, and we tried to explain what is libertarianism, often they said, well, but what would this do to economic structure? Are you going yeah. to interview someone who's going to destroy our economy? And yeah. we would try to defend you, and we did, but I think you can much better do this yourself. How do you respond to people who hear your idea and intu intuitively say, this is not feasible today, this is, an, yeah. this is a nice dream, but... No, but I think we need to change the economic structure. So if people say, what would it do with your, would it change our economic structure? The answer would be yes. And I think that would be a good thing. So um, the, the most uh, um, radical or most uh, critical version of this critique is that I'm a communist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then, oh, you're a communist, you want to uh, uh, abolish um, capitalism. Mm -hmm. But that is, that is, I think, a silly critique because it says you have capitalism and you have plan economy, economy communism. These are the only two options which is really silly because we have many different models of economic, and actually the, the even um, if you say we have had capitalism for a long time, mm -hmm. we've had many different varieties of capitalism. Actually, there's a whole scholarly literature called varieties of capitalism. Mm -hmm. So I'm opposing the current form of capitalism. Yeah. I'm not opposing any form of capitalism. Because what I meant by destroyer, my friends meant by destroyer, is that they worry that we need inequality or we need this structure as it is today with, yes, it has its flaws, but uh, like also what I said about capitalism, it's the best among the alternatives. Like there's no good alternative to it. Like, no, I think that is, that's just rubbish. And the last chapter, uh, points out, I don't discuss them because I, that, will, that would require another book, but I mention all these alternatives that currently been proposed, and many of them are still, for, are still, at least they're market economies, they're not planned economies, they are, um, so they are, they have elements of capitalism, but they are what we, what we once upon a time called mixed economies. Mm -hmm. So a mixed economy is, is an economy where you say, okay, there is a certain role for the market, there's a certain role for the government, and uh, increasingly people are arguing that there should be a role for what they call the commons, mm -hmm. which is citizens that collaborate in meeting a certain material need. So a good example is energy production, renewable energy production. You just see that many citizens actually just say, okay, we're not gonna wait for the government, we're not gonna leave this to the market, we're gonna do this ourselves, and they form an energy cooperative. That's an example of the third way of so your market, government, commons. And you need a mixture between those three modes of delivering um, material goods and services. And the problem, and then there's a the big question about regulation. So sure, you can have markets, but the question is how do you regulate them? And what we've seen is that since the 80s, the regulations have really shifted power from the governments to the, uh, to the enterprises, and then especially the big enterprises. And, and the people in big enterprises, they are uh, often people who in their private capacity are the super rich. And hence, they've also lobbied to change the tax structure. And so that, mean, that is the reason why uh, in, in some countries, in many countries, we have lower tax on income from capital, we have lower tax on profits than we have on income. Income from labor, I should say. So I think these are the questions. And then, and then if I were to argue with your critical friends, I would say, yes, we're gonna change these things. And what are you going to change then, specifically? So I think we need to make the, the uh, we need to shift taxation from, um, taxation on income from labor to taxation on income from capital. And, and, but since wealth inequality has become so large, this is not gonna solve it. I just think we need a wealth tax right now. But you know, even like one of the people I interviewed for this book, one of the, are uh, the, this a group called the Patriotic Millionaires. Mm -hmm. I call them the activist millionaires. You have the, there's a, there are several groups of activist millionaires. One are the Patriotic Millionaires, Millionaires for Humanity, Text Me Now in Austria. So there are different groups. 
and um, they, they argue for a 2% wealth tax. A 2% wealth tax, given current returns on investment, might not even lower wealth inequality, but it would slow down the growth in wealth inequality because the return on investment is much higher than 2%. So you have, um, in, in the book, you outline three approaches, a structural, a fiscal, and an ethical approach um, to libertarianism. This would fall under the fiscal measures, I'm, I assume. Yes. Can you maybe explain what the other two are? Because you actually say that, I mean, when you, when you first start hearing about this book, what you think is that it's about a wealth cap, that it's about a hard limit on how much money you're allowed to keep. But what it actually is, is structural reforms as well, and also ethical mindset yeah. shifts. Can, yeah. you, can you kind of explain yeah, that? Yes, so, um, so I, I, don't think, I don't think we're going to have a wealth cap anytime soon. We may never have it. So I describe it in the book as what I call a regulative ideal, a concept from, from political philosophy, which means it's uh, somewhere on the horizon we say we have all these reasons why we should limit inequality, wealth inequality from the top down. So that's the claim. Mm -hmm. And then I give all these reasons. Of course, if you structure the economy in such a way that you have a different division of the benefits of what we create together, then you, you will reduce the inequality that emerges from, from the economy. Um, so it is, so take for example, um, the extent to which we have companies that are co-owned by the employees. So you, you may find that you may think, oh, companies co-owned by employees, but actually we have some, we have in the Netherlands, for example, um, a, a multinational of an engineering firm Koning, they have their headquarters in Amersfoort, they're employee-owned. That means all the profits that are being made go to the employees. They are super successful in capitalism. It is just that our imagination has made that we don't think about this. But so you could reform companies, mm -hmm. in a, or you could do something more radical like what uh, Yvon Chouinard did, uh, the founder of Patagonia, the, the, the brand of uh, outdoor uh, clothes and stuff, he uh, formed, uh, he made a company, he grew, 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 and then uh, he, dis he said, he was like 80 or 85, he said, what do I need to do with this company? I, I don't want to, I mean, my, I don't want to take it to the stock market, because then actually, once you take it, what the Americans call to take it public, to put it on the stock, on the stock markets, then the shareholder interests always take precedence over anybody else's interests. And that is the problem. If the shareholder, if whatever the shareholder, wa shareholder wants is what happens, then you will always seek to maximize profit and rule over the interests of the employees, of the environment, of the consumers, to the extent possible. So you need different types of companies. These companies exist. They're just not the majority now. But they're also profitable, and they're much more—they're much better for the, for human beings, and actually for other species too, for the world. So I think that is one of the deeper questions here: um, what kind of companies do we want? And I think companies are an instrument for our quality of life. They are not a goal in themselves. You actually say we've um, we've stopped asking what leads to a good life. And you want to bring that back into into our conversations about the economy? Yeah, correct. yeah. So, so I, one of the reasons why I say I'm a bit skeptical about um, whether you can really um, whether economics is the best thing to study if you want to uh, improve the world is that what happened to economics as a discipline is that all the normativity, all the political questions got weeded weeded out or they got push, pushed out, and uh, and hence the if you study economics, you tend to be told it's a non-normative science. That is impossible. It is impossible in the social sciences to do work. You can ask sub-questions that are non-normative, but many of our questions are, many of our theories are normative. For example, in economics, it's taken for granted that economic growth is a good thing. So you're saying that Why would that be a good thing? 
yes, you can give reasons why it would be a good thing, but you can also give reasons why it would be a bad thing. So growth is an instrument to something that really matters, which is our quality of lives, our freedoms, and so forth. So are you saying that economic safety is assumptions as a fact, and now we treat these assumptions as this is the only way to go? Yes, so assumptions are what it says. It's an assumption. It's uh, something you bring into a theory or in research, but we always have to question our assumptions, and that is no longer done if, if disciplines become too homogenous, and I think that's what happened with economics as a discipline over the last 50 years. And I think we should bring normativity back really to the, to the core of economics. And then if you talk about normativity, one of the key concepts, and it's a very simple concept from philosophy, is goes back all the way to Aristotle and earlier, is between means and ends. Ends is why, what, what do we want from life? Well, we want, we want to be happy or we want a high quality of life. We want meaningful lives. We want freedoms. We, we want, I would think, keep the planet livable for those who come after us. Those are all ends. The economic growth or companies or <coughs> universities are means. If one day universities no longer serve a real function, we should abolish them. If the companies, as we now have them, are actually not conducive for those ends, we should reform them. Actually, I also am in favor of reforming universities rather than <laughs> abolishing them. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So that and, and once you have th that distinction clearly in mind, many of the things that that some of my critics say are actually they're focusing on means, but they're so in a in a narrow uh, frame that they um, take it for granted that there must be economic growth, for example. I think um, we've talked quite a bit about the conversations we would have with our friend about the concerns yeah. they would have about the economy. Um, but then even if we manage to clear up some misconceptions or if we quell some concerns, um, you still have the fact that you're holding a very specific group responsible for a range of urgent needs in society. Mm. For, for We have our reasons, but we are also placing them on specific shoulders. Is So then the argument comes up that this is unfair sometimes. Why do you think it's fair? Do you mean it's unfair that we would ask, that we would um, focus on the super rich? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So actually, this is a, this may be a, I'm, I mean it as not as a semantic issue, but I'm not focusing on the super rich. I'm focusing on the wealth that the super rich have. Mm -hmm. And I know this may sound, because for example, sometimes in political arguments they say, uh, we shouldn't have no more billionaires. No, I think we should have no more wealth concentration in the hands of people who have so much that it's billions. I because know you I'm, could say I'm this. I'm sorry to interrupt same. you. Yeah. But maybe also because we're discussing the difference between facts and assumptions. You have some facts with you today. Because I think also many people don't know how many wealth yes. do the bottom people have. Mm -hmm. How many yeah, that's wealth a good thing. do the upper people have. Because maybe it can place this whole discussion in, in context. Yeah. So why am I focusing on, the, on those that have, are in the distribution of wealth, which is uh, where the inequality is biggest, on, um, on the top? Um, I'll, I'll answer that question in a second, but I'll first want to ask you, how do you think that distribution looks look like? So if you, um, if you I'll, I'll just ask you to um, remind it or to imagine it for yourself. And let's take Europe, the whole of Europe, and we take an average. So what, what scholars often do is they divide the, um, the population in groups of 10%, deciles. So take the bottom half of the European population. What is the total percentage of wealth that the bottom half has? So if, it if all wealth were divided exactly equal, 50% of people would have 50% of wealth. And now I'll tell you what they have. They have 1.6% of wealth. Half of the people in Europe have 1.6% of wealth. If you go to the other side and you took, take one-tenth, so one out of, uh, 10 out of 100 people, you ask how much wealth do they have? They have 66.7% of wealth. And then the 1%, so of 100 people, one person actually has 29.3. Um, wealth inequality is just massively unequal. The wealth distribution is massively unequal. 
So I actually don't think that those of us who are comfortably off but not super rich have no duties to improve society. I think we do. But it is, of course, strange to ask people who, for example, only have their income from wealth to argue that uh, they should uh, pay much more if there are people there who inherited millions and just use it, for example, to no longer have to, to never have to work. And inheritance actually is also a special case because that's fully undeserved, because you don't choose your parents. So, so that is why I think, so the reason why I focus on the super rich is not only because I think um, it is um, right morally to first ask them to contribute to solving the issues, but it's also because what we see is that, for example, what I mentioned earlier with political lobbying and so forth, they actually harm societies. There is a very good book illustrating how the super rich in the US changed the fiscal law. They just lobbied round after round after round to make the, the fiscal law better for them, which means they had to pay fewer taxes. I think um, a lot of these reasons are also grounded, because you, you make this philosophical argument, they're grounded in very specific ideas of what is just and justice and how we see justice impacts a lot how we see this argument. So maybe you can explain that a little bit, where, how, where, what idea of justice your argument is rooted in and how that is maybe different from ideas of justice that are predominant in society today. For instance, to clarify, I think many people think it's unjust to take people, the money that, of which people think they rightfully own, to take away their, their wealth. And you're, I think, arguing actually the most fair thing to do to redistribute this wealth. Yeah, so we have, a, we have a distinction in philosophy between what you're entitled to and what you deserve. What you're entitled to is what the, the legal rules, what you can have according to the legal rules. So what you say when people have this, actually we're assuming they're not uh, uh, ev avoid evading the rule, doing uh, criminal stuff and so on, which is of course also how some rich people make their money. But even assuming they play by the rules, they are entitled to that money. That doesn't mean they're rightly, they rightly deserve that money. Because, for example, after the war, the uh, tax burden on the rich was much higher than it was now. So that means the question, you can't speak of, of um, rightful property owning without having a theory of justice. These two things... I mean, pro except, so property is something that we in society have, um, there is, so here is something interesting. There is a theory of property in this book. Mm -hmm. And the theory of property is, I mean, it's not in the book, I, it, I spent like two or four pages on this. The theory of property is that it is, you can't disentangle property from the way we set up society. So that means without a society and a government that actually protects property, you don't have property and you don't have property rights. That means a question like what is property always depends on your own, what is a society and what do we expect from each other? And that is of course um, a particular theory of property. If you say property is God given or so on, we are, we are there having a different conversation. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you advocate in your book for a different conception of justice and property or justice and the money we own than what is present in contemporary society. Also like a, a change of perspective. So I think the view on property is, so I should, I should say that what I argue is not, I think definitely the theory of property, I just uh, cop or copy it or take it from, from uh, other political philosophers. I have not done mm -hmm. any original work on property myself. And I think the work, I, I believe that what I defend mm -hmm is in the sphere of outcomes, what do we observe? But if you translate that to the sphere of uh, opportunities and more abstract theories, there's nothing very radical about what I defend among political philosophers. Why? Because uh, when you asked me earlier, what is the idea of justice that behind this? So if we go back to the arguments I the summarized for why I think we need limitarianism, mm -hmm. um, the utilitarian argument that actually you have a um, better, uh, that in overall you have more well-being if you don't 
if you have money that you transfer or redistribute from those who have a lot to those who have unmet urgent needs. That is what, how uh, all utilitarian theories in philosophy and welfare theories in economics, which is the dominant way, are constructed. Ecological um, sustainability and democracy are forms of harm. I don't know of any viable pol political position in political philosophy or elsewhere that says, yeah, we can harm. So I just think it's just that we haven't thought through what this means. The one on dessert is, the, is I think, the most contested one because my, the view of, it's based on a view of human nature. And there, uh, for me, what I think is crucial is to acknowledge how much luck plays as a role in our lives. And, and that, is, that is contested. And that is, maybe I can say the word specifically, meritocracy. That is where you bring this up, correct? You, I think we'll get back to this um, in a bit. We have a class here, actually, um, called Democracy and Meritocracy. So maybe we can move to the audience and see if there are some questions already. Sure. Um, there's one the microphone here. will come to you. Thank you. Hi, Ingrid. Um, I have a question on something you said kind of early on in the interview. Um, you know, this idea that no one person deserves past a certain massive wealth. Um, but you've also written that being wealthy in itself is not an intrinsically morally uh, bad social state. So I was just wondering, how do you align these two perspectives? I may have changed my view. So, of course, I started to work on limitarianism 12 years ago, and there is in my academic work some development. So, I, uh, it's more that um, I guess what I'm trying to think, um, do you remember when, where I wrote this second statement? Yeah, so having too much was the first what paper I wrote on this. So, you know, there are, there are people, especially if you debate this, not with academics, but with, with, uh, in the public, uh. I've actually been asked the question, why don't you just say that all super rich people are evil? Well, the answer is because they are not all evil. Many of them are not evil at all. So I don't want to make any judgments about their character or about their, uh, that was what I was uh, implying. And also this, uh, so one chapter in this book, the penultimate one, or the, one of the last where I try to argue how the super rich themselves would benefit from having a less, um, not being so rich. Um, I've always thought that even if that were not true, the other arguments to do with harms and, and with deservingness actually are enough to say they shouldn't have that wealth. So that's why I, in the beginning I tried to stay away from, from uh, saying anything about whether it would uh, be uh, bad for them. Uh, so uh, it's, it, and then there's bad, and there bad in two senses. There's bad, like, does it affect their own well-being? I think the increasing evidence is yes, that actually it changes their character, not for the better. It, they lose friends. They also have anxieties that become irrational. They actually, and the, I think the biggest argument is that there's increasing evidence that wealth hoarding is like a, an addiction, that they become addicted to always wanting to have more, more, more. But all of that put aside, the question is, of course, if you were, if if somebody were now to be super rich, should I then say um, they that is a bad state? Well, I do think they should do something about it. I do think they should really, uh, yeah, not sit on that money. Okay, I think we have time for one more here. Oh, you can uh, hello. Um, I have a question about the practical implications of your worldview, because, um, for example, my great grandparents, they were so-called tax Belgians. So when there was a super tax implemented, I think in the 70s in the, uh, the Netherlands, they moved right across the border, so they didn't have to pay those taxes. Um, what is your view or opinion on the transboundary complex? issue around like just fiscality in the world or Europe? Yeah, that's a great question. 
So that's also, I, I agree, this is a problem. There are actually many more practical problems, which is why I say it is a, a regulative ideal, something where we should strive for. We will never fully get there. The uh, German-Canadian political philosopher and economist Peter Dietsch has written a book called Catching Capital. It's precisely about this, like how can you change the uh, financial global uh, institutions such that the uh, mobility we now see with capital actually is, as he says it, we, we catch it. And he, ple he pleads for a set of measures, including that, uh, for example, companies are, one of the problems with why, co why some multinational companies pay so little taxes is that they, they do something called profit shifting. They divide up their company in different parts, and then they sit, set, set one unit in uh, Bermuda where the uh, profit tax is, I believe, zero, or they, and they uh, have other entities elsewhere, and then they sell, for example, they do internal uh, transactions. For example, they sell, from one unit, they sell the right to use the logo. And, and then they do fiscal engineering to the extent that they try to minimize how much taxes they pay. And one of the proposals that Deitch has is to make that impossible. You pay taxes there where you produce, you pay taxes there where you live. Of course, if you move out of the country, that would not solve this problem. But then some people have argued for an exit or an entry tax. So if, if uh, the Netherlands were to impose a tax and Belgium doesn't, then if you move, you pay an exit tax. So there are possibilities. And one thing I find striking is how we globally regulate the movement of people. Actually, it's very difficult for people and very dangerous to move, but money just goes. Hey. Well, um, actually, thank you for this question because um, we want to go to the, recommenda the recommendations you give at the end of your book. Uh, you recommend several measures, including restoring the government's fiscal agency, limiting executive pay, confiscating dirty money, also the way money can flow over in the world, but you also say, we need to dismantle neoliberal ideology. And we wonder, what do we mean when we're talking about this concept of neoliberalism? What, what is neoliberalism? And what, what, what are we going to dismantle then? Yeah. So neoliberalism is, uh, can be uh, seen as a set of uh, institutional ch changes. It can be seen as a set of ideas. So that's then an ideology. Some people call it a culture. There are scholars in... Uh, political economy, cultural studies, political science, sociology, all these different disciplines looking at this from their own lens. What I basically, and also historians, historians is an increasingly important group. How I introduce it in the book and why I think I cannot avoid talking about this is that it was basically the change we've seen uh, in the US and UK end of the 70s in continental Europe in the 80s whereby we had a set of uh, uh, measures, privatization of uh, public uh, en enterprise, or, uh, um, so privatization, um, globalization, increasing globalization, and all the international uh, measures that came with that, uh, reducing the welfare state, mm -hmm. um, and then also at the set of ideas, um, a different view of human nature whereby we are increasingly keep held responsible for the outcomes in our life. And, um, Is that meritocracy? Or? Yes, so if you're, if you're successful, you can take all the credits for it. If, you, however, you're, uh, um, you end up in a bad situation, then you made some wrong choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of uh, one of the underlying assumptions of, of uh, neoliberalism is that Competition is the best way to organize the way we interact. Because by competition, everybody will work harder and it will incentivize people to make the best for, well, for the others. And there is a view of human nature here that I, that I think is problematic for two reasons. Well, more, but two important ones. One is we are not just motivated by external, external uh, rewards. And competition is because of external rewards. Money status or some other uh, thing. We do actually a lot because we're intrinsically motivated. And actually psychologists say yes, the mix of in intrinsic and extrinsic also depends on how you form an institution or a society. That's one thing. So, sorry, but 
um, just to clarify, a lot of people have um, call, have asked how this will affect incentive structures. So how this will affect people's motivations if they don't have a the idea that they can get infinite amounts of wealth. You say that this wouldn't matter because there's other motivations as well. Yes. Yeah, so I think so. There is. I do not know of any empirical research that has looked at what would happen if the, if you were to really reform the whole system, not just in one area, but to change the inf incentive structures at the very top. We're not talking about incentive structures for the big group that's always studied. But I have a couple of examples in the book. For example, there is um, Jeroen van der Veer, who was the CEO of Shell, who in an interview with the Financial Times said, if, I had, if my salary would have been half of what I had received, I would have worked exactly, I would have done exactly the same. So he's basically in an interview saying that at least half of his salary had no impact on, on had, was not justified by incentives at all. So I just think that at this level of CEOs, there is also, um, there's a question whether there are real incentives or whether people just think, well, I'm just gonna, it's like more uh, bluff, right? It's like we have in game theory, you like to bargain to get your way up. So that, so the question is, so that I think is an open question, but even if we were to lose some uh, economic activity at the very top, because you cannot, for example, anymore become so rich as Elon Musk or Bill Gates, then the question is not what would that do with their company, the question is in the other world that we would have, what other companies would start to grow that now cannot grow because they have effectively uh, so much uh, market power. So we can, so that is some, a very important lesson for me debating this book. Often people argue, oh, but then you have a cap and what will that do with one person who's affected? But the right comparison is between the world in which you would have um, the world we have versus the world in which you try to re re uh, reduce inequality. And if you, for example, use that money from tax revenue to invest more in education, health, actually many people who right now would be able to contribute a lot, but are stunned in their economic opportunities because they grow up without any resources, they could become uh, much more productive. So it is really comparing worlds. It's not comparing a marginal effect. Okay. Yeah. So just to go back on neoliberalism, so competition is one, mm -hmm. and the other one is luck. I mean, I've been mentioning it now already three or four times. I just believe, and here I'm standing in the tradition of John Rawls and other political philosophers, that, we, that justice requires us to um, rule out the effects of, uh, un, of unchosen luck on our lives. Mm -hmm. And we, there's so much luck that affects what we can do. There is the natural lottery, our health, our talents, our uh, genes. There's a social lottery, our parents, the country in which you are born, all of this massively influences what you can do with your life. And the third one is market luck. So actually it's also the case that, um, that for example, you have two equally hardworking and equally talented persons, but when they have to decide on whom to give uh, a CEO job or say the lead role in a movie, um, what makes the difference between choosing for one rather than the other is often luck. This is counterintuitive because if you were to have, say, a multi multivariate regression analysis, the vast explanation for who gets the job is their talents, their mm -hmm. track record, and so forth. But that's equal between these people. So the tiny bit that makes the difference, actually, the pivotal bit is luck. So luck is all around us. But the problem is that's not how we have come to look at ourselves. And also, if you take this to the extreme, then you end up in full determinism, where you say, oh, well, luck, it doesn't matter. I, whatever I choose, it doesn't make a difference. And I think we should also stay clear of that position. Why? Because it's fatalistic. But I do think, so, it's, it's, so, there is a, so I think there is a continuum between everything is luck mm -hmm. versus uh, everything is our own responsibility and our own choice and our own agency. And the question is, where on that continuum are you situated? And I think we've moved really yeah. by downplaying the effects of luck on people's lives, and we've moved into holding people constantly responsible for everybody. And I think we should move back to just being more 
understanding that luck plays such a big role and then also trying to compensate for bad luck by, for example, restoring the strength of the welfare state. And just to clarify, like you observe this disbalance, we're moving away, and this is also a connection you see to neoliberalism. That these yeah, neoliberalism yeah. has done this. So neoliberalism in the, in the, in the neoliberalism doesn't want to um, just says luck. I, have, I mean, I as a policymaker have nothing to do with luck. There's no reason because so that's where the underlying, that was what you mentioned earlier, what's the account of justice or fairness below this book. It's not the neoliberalist view because uh, a neoliberal view on fairness would say there is, I mean, whatever bad luck somebody has, it's not my problem. See, and um, even though um, it may sound like libertarianism is a controversial idea, you also mention a survey in your book which says that 96.5% of the Dutch population believes that at some point one has too much wealth, and any additional wealth does not increase one's well-being. But on the other hand, your s the survey also found that far fewer of these respondents support a political action in the form of actually installing a maximum wage or a wealth cap. Wealth cap. Were you surprised by this, by this contrast? Yeah, so, so I did a study to, together with my colleagues from economic sociology in 2018 where we tried to find out whether the theoretical idea of a richest line, mm -hmm. whether that was actually supported in the, by, the, by the people. And we found that, uh, yes, so almost everybody said they can draw a cut between having a very good life versus having so much money that it doesn't add to your quality of life. Nobody needs so much money. So that cutoff, they draw it at different levels. But then we also had a set of questions asking about, say, inheritance taxation, that you would have a cap. And there people say, oh, no, no, no. The majority says, no, we shouldn't do that. I think we probably, uh, so I think there are two things. One is, if you say there is a richest line, there, of course, and you think um, that's just descriptive. You can say, yeah, people have so much, but yeah, that's none of our business. That's one thing. It's it's consistent with saying they have too much, but it's nobody of us can say they shouldn't have it. A second consistent position is to say, yeah, they have way too much, and it would be really good for them to give it away. No government involved. A third position is to say, we should reorganize society such that they don't get so much money in the first place. And I think also what we should have done in that survey in retrospect is, there's one thing between saying, there should be a certain tax, full stop, versus there should be certain tax and this is what we're going to do with the tax revenue. Mm. I think increasingly in the whole debate or non-debate about inheritance taxation, there's no point talking about, well, there's little point talking about inheritance taxation without making clear what this would bring. Does this also have to do with the dichotomy you mentioned about people can't envision what the alternatives are like the mm -hmm. other thing? If we want to change in another world, we need to also maybe be able to envision what this looks like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. So the project I'm, I just started is called uh, Visions for the Future. And it's really trying to, I, because there are already a lot of proposals out there, but mm -hmm. most of them don't come from academia. They come from outside academia. Or they come from scholars who also see themselves as activists in addition to being scholars. So they are like more politically engaged. And um, I think there are some interesting, there are also some crazy proposals out there. But what I found striking is that we don't study them properly. So you have a famous one is Kate Rayward's donut economy, mm -hmm. but you have Tim Jackson as a whole account of what he calls uh, sustainable pr prosperity. You have uh, Thomas Piketty with what he calls democratic socialism, which I actually think is social democracy, but never mm -hmm. mind. You have uh, Jason Hickel, who has... Uh, a form of socialism that really has a strong planning element, which I think, okay, I'm not so sure. And I just think we need to study them properly because of course there's one thing to say, we have all these problems with the current form of neoliberal capitalism, but if you don't have a, an idea of where you want to go. Do you see the most potential in any of these ideas? I re it's too early to say. I don't want to, um, yeah, no, so I think, because you also have, for example, partial proposals. So mm -hmm. the whole basic income debate, for example. Yeah. You could combine that. You could, for example, combine basic income with, with libertarianism. 
But I think one interesting thing... As a thing, proposal. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. But I think my favorite part of the book was maybe your final chapter, because you actually write, and we have the quote here, the current mainstream debate on economic systems has been ruined by dichotomous thinking. And we've talked about the problems with the economic debate mm -hmm. quite a bit, but I think dichotomous thinking is interesting because it can be not having an oversight of the options available, but it can also be, I guess, psychological tendencies that are driving us away from productive conversations. Yeah. And we've, we've talked quite a, a lot about this. We really wanted to hear your thoughts about you, you have these conversations quite frequently with people who... Do you actually have more conversations with people who support or who, who are against your argument, would you I say? I talk with everybody. So, yeah, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, let me see. So politicians tend to just say this is crazy mm -hmm. because they don't think they can... Uh, well, most politicians... Uh, I should say I've been surprised by the reception of uh, wealth holders themselves. Of course, the wealth holders who do not want, who think this is um, a bad idea, they need ignore me, which is fine. But I, 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 there are several wealth holders who have reached out to me. I'm actually tomorrow speaking at an, an event of uh, impact investors. So those are investors that that in, are investing lots of money, but they want to ha create societal impact. And the question is, so they have internally also, uh, as any group has different um, subgroups, and one group actually wonders whether one should not just also, uh, not just invest, but also give away. So give together with invest. So you could say, I'm going to um, invest my money and have a portfolio that partly looks at profit and partly looks at societal revenue. Mm -hmm. That's one step. But... You could also say, I'm going to invest, but actually I'm also just going to gradually also give away all my money so that by the time I'm dead, all my money is gone. But if you're having a conversation with someone who is strongly disagreeing with you, but on a much more fundamental level, so let's say it, you, you've talked about Rawlsian principles of justice that you were yeah. kind of built off of. If someone is on the completely opposite end of that spectrum, how do you think, because I think this characterizes most debates in society mm -hmm. today, how do, how do you m try to move past that? Or how can you have a conversation despite that? So it's a good question, because I do think what we need is to spell out the underlying assumptions. I had a debate with Jessica Flanagan, who is a Nordzikian. She's a professor of political philosophy at Richmond University in the US. She's a libertarian, a Nordzikian. The debate is online, you can find it. It was mm -hmm. recorded in a, a program called Open to Debate. We disagreed about, the question we were asked to debate was, does Taylor Swift deserve her billionaire fortune? Mm -hmm. Now we luckily, very quickly agreed that this was, Taylor Swift was just a hook. We were debating uh, billionaire fortunes. We disagreed about almost everything. But I think if one were to kind of analyze this debate, one could see ontological assumptions, Flanagan, Robbins, normative assumptions, <laughs> Flanagan. So we, it's on the level of assumption. It's also, for example, so her view on the government is uh, you don't need a government. It's actually, it doesn't serve any purpose. In a bad world, it's bad. In a good world, actually, you also don't need it. That's the libertarian view. You don't need a government. I think we cannot solve global collective action problems and we cannot have an account of justice uh, where I said you have to kind of try to minimize the effect of luck on people's lives without a government. So that means if you think you sh a good society has a government or does not have a government, it's already you're already in a different universe. Yeah. Do you also think things like um, there's a lot of people who write about performativity and belief signaling and how increasingly our social identities are tied to our beliefs that we have about redistribution, for example. Do you think that plays a role? I don't know. I, I don't know, really. I just think, um, I mean, m we have had so many debates in society have been about cultural issues. Hmm. Uh, and, and look at the last Dutch elections. Migration was a topic, and then you have the outcome that we have. 
I just think we need to talk about economics. We should all talk about economics. Because actually, we wanted to ask you a question <laughs> about the Dutch election. Yeah. Because what we're observing is that um, when we look at the, uh, the, the elections, what is rising is more right-wing or conservative right-wing politics, extreme right-wing extreme right politics. You can label them whatsoever. But we can be sure of one thing. These ideas do not resonate with libertarianism. And you are not only a political philosopher, but you're also a political activist. And what do you think needs to be done to make libertarianism appeal to a larger audience? Yeah. So I don't share your analysis of the Dutch political situation. Mm -hmm. um, I read both the uh, election programs from uh, the PVV and New Social, Con New Social Contract, mm -hmm. who are now both... Uh, so the VVD clearly is a neoliberal party. The others are not. They are cult culturally... So the PVV is an, a nationalist party and, and you could say a xenophobic party. But socially, uh, they want, for example, to uh, cut the, um, the, uh, the one's own contribution to healthcare. They want to restore elderly homes. All things that have been reduced by cutting the welfare state. New social contract, on the very first page, they start with something like, decades of neoliberal policies have blah, blah, blah. It's anti-neoliberalism all the way. And, and for example, one of the things they proposed, which really surprised me, was that we should have food supplies. I mean, having food supplies in the country is like, it's a measure that really, I mean, if you believe that markets are efficient, you don't need food supplies. So I just, I, but I do think, and I've tried to, because I was uh, in a debate with uh, the leader, Peter Omtzigt, at some point, I tried to argue that, that they haven't thought through what rejecting neoliberalism really implies, but I think that party, at least pre-election, they saw themselves as socioeconomically center, perhaps even center-left, culturally conservative. So I do not think actually, although we may actually have uh, a right-wing government, it's not... The, the, so we should... The access economically and, and culturally, uh, they, can, they do not have to go together. I think, Professor Robbins, we could probably talk for another hour or two. <laughs> we have <laughs> many more questions, and I'm sure the audience does as well, but our hour is up. Um, thank you so much for joining us here today. And thank, thank you. you to the audience for joining as well. Thanks. We have a panel event, uh, Women Plus, that you can sign up for online uh, tomorrow evening here. And uh, next week, we will be interviewing on the 26th, Rob Bauer, Admiral Rob Bauer from NATO. So um, you can join us on our social media and follow the coming events there. Thank you.